Good morning and good evening, everyone, all the audience participants and also experts all of the world. And welcome to a pre ask ADC China Summit. As the chairman of this meeting, I want to like to uh, welcome our co-chair of this webinar, Professor Li Jing from University of Tongji and Eastern Hospital. He is head of the oncology department of this hospital and also the formal chairman of Cisco. Professor Li Jing is the true pilot for international clinical development in oncology. He is also a pilot for all the innovations with the tiniest effort. He always keep trying to bring the breakthrough therapies to patients in China and all over the world. So let's welcome Professor Li Jing to give his Welcome openly to everyone. Please, Professor Lee, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, Mr. Chen's uh, introduction. Uh, well, uh, good morning and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my, my name is Jing Lee from Tongji University East Hospital. Uh, welcome to uh, this summer. Uh, today, we will uh, have our Chinese and uh, global speakers to uh, give presentations on the latest oncology clinical trial progress on ADC drugs and uh, a global panel uh, for an interactive discussion. Uh, as you know, cancer is among uh, China's high priority disease area. Uh, here in China, more than five people die from cancer uh, every minute. About 50% of the global gastric cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, and uh, esophageal cancer is especially uh, in China are diagnosed, diagnosed in, uh, in patients from, from China. However, we have seen encouraging progress in Chinese anti-cancer space uh, with many new biotech developing innovative oncology drugs, including uh, ADC drugs and uh, immunological agents. And also hospitals, uh, in, in hospitals, some uh, scientists yeah. developing uh, quality treat uh, treatments, improving patients' uh, outcomes. Though uh, there are still uh, no ADC drugs approved in China, nevertheless, the ADC drug market is red hot in China. Yeah. There are dozens of Chinese companies are developing innovative AD <coughs> ADC drugs in China and mainly are uh, conducting clinical trials in China. We can hear ADC drug companies founded with uh, tens of millions of dollars by uh, venture capital firms uh, almost on week weekly basis. We can feel an ADC drugs new era happening uh, before our eyes right here uh, in China. Uh, I'd like to express um, our uh, appreciations uh, to the organizers, uh, US Kaka and uh, eChina Health for organizing this meeting virtually online with global speakers and attendees and the need for the uh, conference here in China with local Chinese speakers and uh, attendees. I'm also glad uh, that this forum will present the latest research and the clinical trial progress of ADC drugs uh, from a, a holistic uh, perspective uh, of academy uh, research, drug production, capital, medical, clinical. Uh, I, hope, I hope we can all learn from each other and share our uh, experiences uh, for the com uh, combined team efforts to cure cancer. Uh, thank you very much. Now, let me introduce our co-chair uh, professor Yong Jiu Ban. He is the professor from Seoul National University College of Medicine. Uh, he's, uh, as you know, he's a famous uh, GI expert in the world. 
And uh, he also is a former uh, president of CASMO. Uh, in the past uh, two decades, he did a lot of uh, a clinical study as leading PI for lots of key studies in uh, gastrointestinal cancers. Now, please welcome uh, Professor Yong Zhu Bang. Thank you, Professor Lee, for your very kind introduction about me. Now I'll start my lecture. So can I show my slide? Okay. Yeah, please first, uh, would, would you please give us a opening speech? <laughs> yeah, it is my great honor to be here to chair the session with uh, Professor Lee and present the clinical data with uh, one of the famous antibody drug conjugate. It's my great honor. Thank you. Can I start now? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to be here to present the clinical data with trust to map Tekan TDXD in patients with heart positive tumors. TDXD is a heart targeting antibody drug conjugate, ADC, consisting of a humanized anti heart antibody identical to trastumab with a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor payload and an enzymatically cleavable peptide-based link. Potential advantage of TDXD include high drop antibody ratio, that is 7.7 .7 compared to 3.5 of TDM1. Payload of TDXD is a very potent topoisomerase 1 inhibitor. In general, payloads of other antibody drug conjugates are tubulin inhibitors. So it is it has a unique payload. TDXD is stable in systemic circulation with low serum concentration of free payload, result in a better safety profile. In preclinical models, TDXD was effective in heart low tumors as well as heart high or positive tumors. Please see the left panel of the figure. Red line is for TDXD and blue line is for TDM1. As you can see here, in heart to 3 positive tumor, efficacy of TDXD was similar to that of TDM1. However, in heart to 2 positive or 1 positive tumor, TDXD was much more effective than TDM1. This shows the design of the phase one study. Phase one study consisted of those escalation part and those expansion part as shown here. The drug was given once every three weeks. In the dose escalation part, patient with breast or gastric cancer were treated at six different dose levels from 0.8 milligram per kick to 8 milligram per kick. In the dose expansion core part, five quarters of patients, including hot to low breast cancer, were enrolled. This is the summary of those escalation part of phase one study. First, the maximum tolerance those MTD of TDXD was not reached, and no those limiting toxicities were observed. 
In this heavily pre-TD population, TDXD showed promising anti-tumor activity, even in hot to low expressing tumors. TDXD 5.4 and 6.4 milligram per kick resulted in the best balance between efficacy and safety. And these two doses were chosen for further studies. This table shows the baseline characteristics of patients in phase one study. As expected, the patients were heavily pleated before the enrollment. The median number of prior therapies in HER2 positive breast cancer was seven. And all of these patients had been treated with TDM1. The table shows anti-tumor activity in each cohort. In HER2 positive breast cancer, confirmed objective response rate, OLR, was 59.5%, with duration of response of 20.7 months. In HER2 low breast cancer, OLR was 44.4%, duration of response was 11 months. In heart positive gas cancer, OLR was 43.2% with duration of response of seven months. In other tumors with heart expression, OLR was 36.7%. Now I will talk about phase studies. In this phase two study, patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer that was previously treated with TDM1 were enrolled. TDXD was given as three do different doses every three weeks. 184 patients were treated with 5.0 milligram per key of TDXD. As you can see here, confirmed objective response rate by independent central review was 61.4% with a complete response rate of 6.5%. Median duration of response was 20.8 months. This slide shows the progression free and overall survivors. Median progression free survival was 90.4 months. Median overall survival was 24.6 months. And 85% of patients were alive at one year. In the phase two study for third-line gastric cancer, two cohorts of patients were enrolled. In the primary cohort, patient with centrally confirmed heart positive gastric or G junction cancer that progressed on at least two prior lines of therapy, including fluoropyrimidine, platinum, and trosmep were enrolled and randomized two to one to receive TDXD 6.4 milligram per kick or Fission's choice of irinotecan or paclitaxel. In the explored court, patient with HER2 IHC 2 positive fish negative or IHC 1 positive gas cancer were enrolled. In the primary court with HER2 positive gas cancer, confirmed. ORR with TDXD was 51% and it was 14% with chemotherapy. Median duration of response was 11.3 months and 3.9 months respectively. This slide shows progression free and overall survival. So as you can see here, progression-free survival and overall survival were 
much better with TDXD compared to chemotherapy. Median progesterone free survival was 5.6 months, and median over survival was 12.5 months with TDXD. In the exploratory court, ORL was 37% in HER2 two positive tumors and 90% in HER2 one positive tumors. This data, although small in size, strongly suggests that TDXD may also be effective in HER2 low gastric cancers. This is the fluorescent free and over survival and median progression free survival were 4.4 months and 2.8 months respectively. This figure shows the study design for patient with refractory non-small cell lung cancer. There were two cohorts. Cohort one is for her to overexpressing non-small cell lung cancer. That is her to IHC three positive or two positive. Core two is for her to mutated non-small cell lung cancer. All patients received 6.4 milligram per key of TDXD, and the primary endpoint was ORR by independent central review. In patients with heart to overexpressing non-small cell lung cancer, confirmed objective response rate was 24.5% and this control rate was 69.4%. Median duration of response was six months. There was no difference between IHC three positive tumors and IHC two positive tumors. The median progression free survival was 5.4 months and the median overall survival was 11.3 months. In patients with HER2 mutated non-small cell lung cancer, confirmed objective response rate was 61.9%, and this control rate was 9.5%, and median duration of response was not reached. Median progesterone free survival was 14 months, and median over survival was not reached. Please note that her to mutation was a better predictor for response than her to overexpression in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. This is for patients with colorectal cancer. Patients with her to positive tumor were enrolled in court war A and patients with heart to low tumors were enrolled into court B or C. All patients received 6.4 milligram per kick of TDXD, and the primary endpoint was ORR. In court A, confirmed objective response rate was 40.3%, and this control rate was 83%. Median duration of response was not reached, and median person free survival was 6.9 months. Finally, I will talk about the toxicity profile of TDXD. This table shows treatment emergent adverse event from 289 patients in phase one study. The most frequent adverse events were gastrointestinal or hematologic in nature. Adverse events were generally grade one or two. Common grade three or four adverse events were hematologic, including anemia and neutropenia. In summary, TDX has manageable safety profile. There is one adverse event of special interest. That is interstitial lung disease, IRD, or pneumonitis. The figure shows occurrence of IRD 
in 184 patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer treated with TDXD at 5.4 mg per T from phase one, phase two studies. As you can see here, 15.2% of patients experienced an IRD. The median time to first event was 5.6 months and 97% of events occurred in the first 12 months. Most were grade World War II and five patients died due to grade five IRD event. With early identification and prompt treatment, this toxicity is manageable, we think. In conclusion, TDXD was effective in patients with heart positive breast or gastric cancer and was approved for these two indications in several countries. TDX seems to be also effective in heart positive or heart mutated non-small cell lung cancer, heart positive colorectal cancer, and heart low breast cancer or gastric cancer. The overall safety profile of TDX was manageable, and the most common adverse events were gastrointestinal or hematologic in nature. Interstellar lung disease is an important risk with TDXD and close monitoring is required. Thank you for your attention. Now, I'd like to invite our second speaker today, Dr. Aditya Bardia from Massachusetts General Hospital. The title of his lecture today is Targeting Tumor Specific Antigens in Triple Negative Breast Cancer, Finding Positive in the Negative. Dr. Bardia, please. Hello, sorry we couldn't meet in person. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about targeting tumor-specific antigens in triple negative breast cancer, finding positive in the negative. These are my disclosures. If we talk about actionable targets in triple negative breast cancer, we can divide them into three categories. The first is targeting key genomic drivers and signaling pathways. An example of that is BRCA mutation. The Olympia trial was a landmark trial which demonstrated that the use of a PARP inhibitor Olaparib was associated with improvement in progression-free survival as compared to standard chemotherapy with a hazard ratio of 0.58. And this was for patients with metastatic breast cancer who had germline BRCA mutations. The improvement led we saw similar results with telozoprib, and this also led to the FDA approval of telozoprib. Now, how can we do better? We've seen improvement in responses with the use of a PARP inhibitor, but there appears to be synergy between a PARP inhibitor and PD-1 agent. In a clinical trial looking at combination of a PARP inhibitor plus a PD-1 inhibitor, longer with the combination as compared to PARP inhibitor alone. And that is where potentially the combination uh, has value, it can improve the duration of response to a PARP inhibitor. The phase two, three clinical trial looking at combination of PD-1 plus PARP inhibitor as maintenance therapy is currently ongoing. 
So we talked about BRCA mutation. The other thing to consider is the PI3 kinase AKT pathway in triple negative breast cancer. kinase AKT pathway. And in a randomized phase two trial, the combination of chemotherapy plus an AKT inhibitor was associated with improvement in progression-free survival. Results presented last year by Dr. Rebecca Dent at San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium evaluated the use of ipad assertive with Taxol as compared to Taxol plus placebo as first-line therapy for patients with measurable Overall, the trial was negative. There was no improvement in progression-free survival. This was somewhat disappointing. However, we await the data for overall survival as well as biomarkers. So we talked about targeting genomic drivers and signaling pathways. The other strategy is to target cell surface markers for selective delivery of potent agents. It's not about specific pathways, it's about the cell surface markers or receptors and use that to deliver Example of an antibody drug conjugate is sasituzumab govtk It's an antibody drug conjugate that's specific for trope 2, has a high drug to antibody ratio, and hydrolysis of the linker releases SN38 extracellularly in the tumor microenvironment, providing a bystander effect. The drug was provided accelerated approval by the FDA and more recently received full approval. The idea is that the antibody drug conjugate would bind to the receptor, the trope 2, get internalized and release SN38. The drug also has a bystander effect. Some of the SN38 uh, can go in the tumor microenvironment. In, in the pivotal phase three trial, the SN trial, Patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer who had received two or more prior lines of chemotherapy were randomized to receive sasituzumab govtk and was his treatment of physician's choice. Overall, the trial was positive. It showed improvement in both progression-free survival and overall survival. Patients who received sasituzumab govtk and had a median progression-free survival Similarly, patients who received sasituzumab govtk and had an overall survival of 12.1 month hazard ratio of 0.48. And in terms of response rate, the response rate was very similar to what was seen in the phase one trial. Uh, the response rate with sasituzumab govtk was 35% as compared to 5% with standard chemotherapy. Now, the drug has side effects. In particular, it tends to cause neutropenia and diarrhea. Appears to be some correlation with UGT1 and 1 polymorphisms. Patients who have homozygous 28 to 28 UGT1 and 1, they cannot metabolize SN38 that well. And the incidence of fibrin neutropenia is much higher in this population. How about biomarkers? Does trope 2 predict for benefit? In the ASCEND trial, even patients who had low trope 2 expression derived benefit with sasituzumab govtk and response rate of 22% as opposed to 6% with standard chemotherapy. So regardless of trope 2 expression, patients derived benefit with sasituzumab govtk as compared to standard chemotherapy. And I think that's largely because of the bystander effect. How about other trope 2 ADCs? Another trope 2 ADC is Excitin derivative of deruxetan, and the linker is also different. It has a tetrapeptide based linker. Results of the efficacy of data potomab deruxetan were presented at ASMO Breast a couple months ago. In the phase one clinical trial evaluating data potomab deruxetan with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. 
Other ADCs include LIV1 ADC, which targets LIV1 clinical trial, looking at this agent as a single agent, response rate of 25% was seen in patients with metastatic disease. And then finally, U31402 um, is another antibody drug conjugate that targets HER3. It has a deruxtan payload uh, and targets HER3. Again, impressive response rate was seen with this antibody drug conjugate in heavily pretreated patients with metastatic breast cancer. So we looked at uh, ADCs, sasituzumab govitecan, dedopotumab deruxetan, ladiratuzumab vidotin, and trastuzumab deruxetan, as well as U. EGFR, ADCs that target ROR2, ADCs that target CEA. So these different ADCs target different antigens that can be overexpressed in breast cancer. Now, finally, talking about targeting immune microenvironment, that's where PD-1 inhibitors come in. They don't target the tumor per se, they, they can, but they also affect the tumor microenvironment. And in particular, if we look at all of these uh, agents together, you can see how these various drugs can target different components related to the cancer. Immunotherapy, such as atezolizumab, pembrolizumab, darvalumab, can target PD-1 and PDL1, the tumor microenvironment. Antibody drug conjugates, sasituzumab, govitecan, ladiratuzumab, vidotin, uh, U3142 or petratumab, deruxetan, can target LIV1, trope 2 HER3. AKT inhibitors targeting the PI3 kinase. How about uh, combination therapy? How do we move the field forward? We want to further improve the response rates. I think the answer is combination therapy. Response rates can also improve the duration of responses, as was seen um, with combination of LIV1 ADC with aminotherapy. So in conclusion, PARP inhibitor olaprib, teluzaprib is the new standard of care for BRCA mutant metastatic breast cancer. Ongoing trials are evaluating PARP inhibitor in combination with immunotherapy. Sasituzumab govitecan is the preferred treatment in pretreated patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Ongoing studies are evaluating SG in combination with other targeted therapies as well as immunotherapy. In addition, there are multiple targeted therapies in development that target different genomic pathways and antigens overexpressed in triple negative breast cancer. And these different drugs that target different antigens would Thank you, Dr. Bardia, for your very nice presentation. Now we'll move on to the next topic. And the fourth map, bidontin in previously treated advanced urocell cancer. The speaker is Dr. Thomas Pauls from Barch Cancer Center. Dr. Pauls, please. Um, hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I'm just trying to share my screen, but um, it's not letting me do that. I don't know if there's a way of getting someone to allow me to share my screen. Uh, we have to click the screen, oh, screen share, screen sharing. Oh, yeah, it's let me do that now. Okay, I've got it. Thank you. I got it. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really sweet of you. Um, I'm going to talk about antibody drug treatment. I'm also going to talk about um, sasituzumab govitecan in urothelial cancer because it's been recently approved. Um, so I thought I would do both topics um, uh, by the FDA. I have a number of disclosures. Um, in 40 of the dotin is an antibody drug conjugate, conjugate uh, and of course it has a similar um, uh, a similar mechanism of action as the other antibody drug conjugates. That you've heard about today. Uh, it's a, an antibody drug conjugate that targets Nectin 4. 
Nectin-4 is heavily overexpressed in urothelial cancer. People talk about it being overexpressed in 100% or 95% of tumors. And I think that's true, and I'm gonna show you some data later to suggest that that is the case. <clears throat> it um, has a unique linker molecule. I think we don't talk enough about the linker molecules in, uh, in, um, uh, in, with ADCs. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And the payload is an, uh, a microtubule uh, agent, MMAE, which uh, is not widely used in urothelial cancer. Um, Infortumab vedotin was tested in phase one and phase two trials um, with activity. Um, and they showed, and the drug showed response rates in the region of 40%. The key to antibody drug conjugates is the targeted delivery of the payload, in this case, MMAE. The quality of the linker molecule is crucial. If it's too loose, um, the drug becomes widely distributed in the body and there's systemic toxicity. Uh, if it's too tight, the drug is not released into, um, into the, uh, the cells adequately and the drug doesn't have activity. So the linker molecule is absolutely crucial in this process. Um, and, uh, and we don't talk enough about the linker molecule technology. Um, in Fortumab, the dotin has been tested in platinum refractory uh, urothelial cancer, and indeed in immune refractory urothelial cancer. Um, this is the PIRS randomized phase three data, which I'm gonna to present to you today. The pivotal data um, is um, based on phase two data, which shows response rates of 40% in this setting. Historically, in urothelial cancer, response rates in platinum refractory disease were about 10%, and chemotherapy was the standard of care. You can see in the orange box here, chemotherapy is the standard of care, and you can see three different drugs were, were available. The reason why that's the case is we were unclear, we have been unclear about the standard of care in this environment. Infortumab vedotin was given at 1.25 milligrams per kilogram on a weekly basis, on a four weekly cycle with the last week off. This is relevant, clearly the half-life of the drug is short, um, but it means that patients are coming to the hospital essentially on almost a weekly basis. Dose reductions were permitted to one milligram per kilogram. And on top of that, um, a number of patients also had dose delays or skipped um, particular doses of therapy. Progression-free survival was the primary endpoint with overall survival as the secondary endpoint. You can see here that infotimabidotin was associated with a significant survival advantage compared to chemotherapy with a hazard ratio of 0 0.7, resulting in a 30% reduction in death. You can see here also the survival was approximately 13 months versus nine months. You can see the curves going apart and they stay apart. And that is important because it's suggesting that some patients are deriving a longer term benefit associated with the agent. The forest plot analysis for overall survival is also relevant. It shows that infortumab vedotin is outperforming chemotherapy broadly across almost all subgroups. Some subgroups are small. That includes more than three prior lines of therapy and female gender. The smaller subgroups have very wide confidence intervals and it's not possible to overinterpret those data. The progression-free survival for this was also statistically significant. And again, you can see the curves going apart early and staying apart with a hazard ratio of 0 0.62. It's important to note that the control arm is short with about four month progression-free survival. This underlines the aggressive nature of this cancer in this setting. I would like to impress on you very briefly 
that this is not necessarily the best place to test drug. I think you can see that a large group of patients progress very quickly. This is an aggressive cancer. And therefore, my feeling is, and I'll show you some data to show the drug works better in other settings. The response rate was 40 versus 17%. This, I think, is reinforces the phase one and the phase two data is it in this environment with a CR rate of 5%. Adverse event profiles for antibody drug conjugates are really important because they're different from chemotherapy and immune therapy. The targeted approach means that the drug ideally should be delivered locally. However, if other organs such as the skin also overexpress the target, you're likely to get high levels of toxicity. This is an important issue on the other hand, an equally important issue is if the linker molecule is not tight enough and the drug is released into the circulation, one will get systemic side effects associated with the drug because it's being released into the systemic therapy and is not essentially targeted chemotherapy. This balance is very important. The treatment-related adverse events from fortumab vodotin occurred in approximately half patients at grade three or four. And you can see that's very similar to chemotherapy. However, there were some adverse events um, which were more common within fortumab vodotin and others more common with chemotherapy. The adverse events of special interest were skin reactive peripheral neuropathy and they occurred at a grade three or more in 15%, 5%, and 4% of patients, respectively. The majority of these were manageable, but we do need to educate one another about these adverse events because they're different from chemotherapy and the global community is less familiar with treating them. I'm going to move on to a second study, which was also presented recently. This study um, looks at infortumab vodotin in a group of patients that is less heavily pretreated. These patients have only previously been treated with the immune therapy and not immune therapy and chemotherapy. We would expect to see response rates in the region of approximately 40% in this group of patients. You can see here, the numbers are smaller. It's a phase two study. As I said before, this, uh, you can see all the patients have previously had immune therapy, but they've not previously had chemotherapy. This describes the nectin level in 300 being the maximum nectin level. And you can see there are only about 10% of patients who really don't express nectin. The previous speaker talked about biomarker work. We've not seen much biomarker work yet within fortumab vodotin in urothelial cancer. The response rate was shown here at 52%, and 88% of patients had stabilization of disease. As I described earlier, the earlier we go with this drug, the more activity we seem to see. Progression-free survival at six months and overall survival at 15 months with this response rate of 52% together looks very competitive as a single agent in this environment. These data underpin the activity of infortumab vodotin in this disease. The toxicity profile in this study was very similar to what we saw in the randomized phase three. Clearly the data was less robust because the numbers were smaller. But those adverse events of special interest, skin rash, hypoglycemia, peripheral neuropathy, following the expression associated with uh, nectin in the systemic, in, in the body were seen. This leads to the next and really important step the next step as described by the previous investigator 
is the combination with pembrolizumab. This is in carboplatin eligible frontline metastatic disease. And you can see here in a small cohort of patients, 43, response rates this time of 73% with disease control rates of 93%. These data look more impressive than we, what we've seen previously for chemotherapy, where response rates tends to be in the region of 45%. And therefore, this combination is being taken forward in a randomized phase three study, EV302, which is pembrolizumab plus infortumab vedotin versus chemotherapy. Why do we think this combination will be additive or synergistic when chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab or atezolizumab in urothelial cancer was not. So in the 130 trial and in the 361 trial, gemcis or gemcarbo plus atezolizumab or pembrolizumab did not show additivity. Response rates were not higher and the trials were negative. It's my feeling that the partner associated with the immune checkpoint inhibitor is extremely important in determining whether or not the trial will be positive. Gemcitabine is quite a myelosuppressive drug, whereas pembrolizum, whereas um, infortumab vedotin is not. And therefore it might be that infortumab vedotin influences the tumor microenvironment in a different way from other chemotherapy agents, which allows for these drugs to have significant activity. You can see here the adverse event profile in line with what we saw previously. Skin reaction, peripheral neuropathy and hyperglycemia. And so I move very quickly onto sasituzumab govotecan, which came out in JCO only last week. I'd like to congratulate the authors. In this environment, the response rate is slightly lower than we saw with infortumab vedotin. Sasituzumab uh, is a drug we've, which has been described to you just in the last presentation, which targets CROP2 uh, attached to SN38, which is quite a myelosuppressive drug. The response rate of 27% is again encouraging in this environment in a heavily treated, pre-treated population with progression-free survival of five months and overall survival of 11 months. These data, in my opinion, don't look quite as impressive in indirect comparisons as we've seen with infortumab vedotin. And as I said before, the adverse event profile is different. Remember that really important balance and think about the linker molecule. Is this systemic treatment side effects? Sorry, is this systemic side effects associated with SN38 because the linker molecule is too loose? We know SN38 is associated with diarrhea and myelosuppression. And we can see that here. These adverse event profiles are different with different ADCs. And therefore the assumption that we will be able to combine them successfully and get the same result is not correct. So to repeat that, the antibody drug conjugates clearly are not all the same. Their targets are different as their adverse event profile is different. And this drug, sasituzumab gobotecan, is likely to influence the tumor microenvironment in a different way from infortumab vedotin. And therefore, the assumption that the same partner is important is not relevant. And here, we may be better off targeting, combining with targeted therapy or chemotherapy. So I hope today I've explained to you that antibody drug, drug conjugates have activity in your ethereal cancer. Infortumab vedotin is leading the way with a positive randomized phase three study, combination data, and indeed data in early disease. It works, the linker molecule is important, and indeed what we're seeing is a manageable but different toxicity profile. There are many unanswered questions around the biomarker, around whether ADCs have different cross resistance with one another, Around the durability of response, we've seen, we've seen immune therapy being associated with long-term durable responses. 
That may or may not be the case with antibody drug conjugates. It looks like that's the case in some settings. And of course, these novel combinations, which I talked about at the end, which require careful consideration around the effect of individual drugs on the tumor microenvironment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. Now I'd like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Ji Pang from Peking University Cancer Hospital. Dr. Pang will speak on the first antibody drug conjugate drug independently developed in China, that is RC4A. Dr. Pang will speak in Chinese. You can use simultaneous translation into English. Dr. Pang, please. Okay, thanks, Dr. Pang. Uh, I'm sorry because of the misunderstanding, so I will uh, use Chinese for um, my speak. Uh,好的,嗯,大家好,就是我大概花十几分钟时间去跟大家去分享一下,就是我们中国首个自主研发的这个AGCD药物RC18的这个研发的制程,我是来自北京肿瘤院消化肿内科。那我想呢,呃,对于胃癌来讲呢,因为,呃,现在,呃,胃癌中国的胃癌发病率是非常高的,那这样的话我们大概有每年大概有将近一半的病人都是在,呃,中国发生,而且呢,呃,那中国呢
。那我想这个呢是它这个 PK 的这个这个数据，我们可以看到呢，呃，那从上面去讲呢，就是说，呃 ，IC 四八 ADC 呢这种药物呢，它呢。与喝吐呢，第一呢，它实际上它这种抗体选择它并不是居住的单抗，它有更高的这种亲和力。呃，抗原表位呢，实际上是跟居住单抗相近，但是不是完全相同的。另外呢，就是它有比较好的这种内吞的特性和这个可裂解的连接子。另外呢，就是从疗效配伍上来讲呢 ，D I R 呢是等于这个四的。那么我们主要的还是看一下，就是说我们作为一个医生来讲，嗯，我们在这个研发历程当中，我们怎么嗯。什么样的一个一个一个过程吧？那我想呢，其实我们最早的时候去做这个这个 R C 四八这个药物的时候呢，实际上我们自己呢也做了一些这个临床前的一些研究，因为我们呃还是很很关心，就是说我们这个药物到底什么样的病人是有，因为我们当时来去做这个药物的时候呢，第一呢，实际上、嗯、我们除了这个呃。T D M 1这样，但这个呢，因为在胃癌其实它并没有没有上市。那另外呢，我们其实在这类药物呢，我们其实以前并没有太多的经验。呃，所以呢，我们最早的时候呢，我们其实我们自己呢，就是我们科里呢，我们会做了一些这个临床前的结果。我们发现呢，除了对于这个核毒三个加，呃，在 P D S 模型中有比较显著的逆流作用之外呢，实际上呢，我们在可以看到呢，在临床前里面，这个核毒两个加。和一个家呢，也能看到一些这个这个趋势，所以我们在最早去做这个一期的临床研究的时候呢，在我们叫 C 呃零零二这个研究的时候呢，我们还是去主要其实是还是要看它药代药动的特点。另外一个呢，就是我们呃也还是比较特异性的去选择一些我们对于核毒 I C 相对低表达的一个呃也一些一些患者吧。那另外呢，就是我们刚才去讲的，就是说 T D M 1呢实际上是这样，但是呢。我们最早的时候，因为我们作为研究者呢，然后去跟申办方去商量的时候，我们其实，呃，我们还是嗯用了一个相对比较低的剂量，然后去去爬坡，然后来去嗯呃，当然我们这个设计也是三加三，也还是一个嗯比较传统的我们一个对于一期药物的一个设计。那在剂量扩展这个阶段的时候呢，呃，我们还是呃除了我们入胃癌的病人之外，其实我们还入了一些呃虎符的。哎，然后呢，还有一个尿路上片，而且呢，在这里面我们都看到了，就是对于喝度相对低表达的病人，我们也看到他的一些这样的疗效。所以我想呢，对于这个刚才我们一位讲者其实也提到了尿路上片的这些治疗，我们可以看到，我们这个药物呢，实际上在二零一七年的时候呢，那当时因为我们在一期里面看到这样的数据，所以我们可以看到这个在这个尿路上片呢，我们国内的这个嗯研究者发起这个二期研究项目里面，我们可以看到在阿斯科呢也是。呃，进行了这个 poster discussion， 然后，呃，而且呢，在这个 A C 药在美国实际上也取得了这个 F D A 的这个突破性的认证，就基于它比较好的这种疗效，就是说我们在一个二期的这个 H2 呃呃高表达这么这个尿路上皮癌病人里面，它有这个百分之超过百分之五十的 O R， 那 P F S 呢，嗯，六点九个月 ，O S 呢，十三点七个月。那么从这个安全性和有效性来看呢，实际上，嗯。呃，它还是一个，呃呃，就是我们针对微管的这个呃化疗药呢。那从我们自己的感受上来讲，和这个数据上来看呢，实际上第一呢，就是呃，我们通过了这个两毫克和呃二点五毫克的 c o r a W， 然后呢，我们来看呢，就是说从这个安全上来讲呢，我想整体上呢，实际上还是可控的。那 O 二呢，我们可以看到呢，在呃，两毫克的时候大概是有百分之十九，那我们在二点五毫克呢有百分之二十七点三，所以我们呃后续的呢就还是采用了二点五毫克每千克的这个剂量。那正是因为我们这个一期的这个研究呢，我想呢，我们第一呢，我们呃确定了二期研究的剂量，另外一个呢，就是我们可以看到在尿路上边，另外在其他的这个流中呢，我们也看到这种活性，所以我想呢，目前呢，待会我们也还会提到我们在多个研究里面去告诉了我们这个研究的这个。呃，就是还是在设计了其他流种这些研究。那另外呢，我们想呢，就是在胃癌里面，我们可以看到了，就是说比较好的疗效呢。于是呢，我们在这个中国呢，就呃设计了一个 C 零零八这个研究，就是它实际上是一个单臂的研究，在二线及二线治疗失败的这种病人呢，我们入选的病人呢是两个加和三个加即可。这个我想呢，是跟我们刚才提到的头个研究呢，还不是完全一样。那从主要疗效结果上来看呢，我们可以看到了，从 RIC。呃，去独立评估呢，我们这个确认的 O R 呢是百分之二十四点四，那 D C R 率呢是四十一点七，这是它的这种
游泳脱瀑布图就是肿瘤体积叫肌腺变化的这种情况和这个靶心道场景叫肌腺变化的情况。那我们可以看到呢，就是说不管是在二线、三线和四线呢，就是我们通过这些亚组的分线来看呢，我们在多线治疗失败之后呢，仍然能看到了就是比较好的这个呃呃疗效。那我们这个 O2 呢，基本上大概在百分之。二十到百分之二十五，大概这个样子。那第三率呢，在百分之四十。那 PFS 呢是四点一个月，然后这个 OS 呢是七点九个月。那我呃在，而且呢，呃还是也比较有意思的呢，就是说我们能看到在低表的，就是 h 突两加分析阴性的这部分病人里面，也能看到比较好的这种这种治疗的疗效。那从安全性来讲呢，从呃主要的不良反应呢，还是一些血液的毒性，那脱发，还有一些神经毒性啊、呃，其他的呢，我想呢，基本上从这个治疗的这个过程来看，基本上还是可控的。那另外呢，因为嗯、呃，刚才这个刀刀棒其实也介绍了 DS 八二零幺的这个这些呃数据呢，我们可以看到呢，其实呢，那我们嗯、呃、刚才也提到了，就是说国内的这个胃癌特点其实和日韩其实还是不是完全的一致。那我想呢，从这个入组的这个患者，我们当然这是一个横向的比较，我们可以看到临床和肿瘤特征实际上要比 DS 8 0 1要更差一些。另外一个呢，就是说我们可以看到 DS 8 0 1在对比这个化疗里面，其实它那个化疗的这个 O R 率呢也有百分之十几。那我想呢，这个实际上，呃，至少从我们这个临床的这个实践来讲呢，其实我们很难在三线及三线之后的病人里面，在国内我们能达到这么高的这种。这种有效率，当然这一些呢，我想都是一些我们横向的对比。所以呢，对于这个 C 零八这个研究呢，我们可以看到呢，就是说对于 H2 两个加和三个加，就是说我们这个还是不同于我们传统的就是呃两个加肺系阳性，嗯、呃、或者是三个加这么病，我们看的很种疗效。那独立呃评呃评审委员会呢来去看的 RC 评估的 O2 呢是百分之二十四点四，那 PFS 呢是。四点一个月 ，OS 呢？中位 OS 是七点六个月。那我想从这个安全上来看，也应该是可控的。那我想呢，也是正是刚才我们提到的，基于了我们这个一期的这个研究，我们可以看到了，呃，在尿路上面这种呃比较好的这种疗效呢，现在呢也还在去做在尿路上面里面这个临床研究，就是 C 零零五这个研究。我想呢，呃，这个呢，刚才我们也提到，这个实际上在这个早在二零一七年呢，就是 ASCO 其实已经报了它的这种。这种呃这种数据，那客观有效率呢，这个是非常的呃理想，就是达到了百分之五十一点二。那我中位的 OS 呢有十三点七个月。那从这个 A E 上来看呢，就是呃其实还是跟我们刚才的这个 C 零零八在胃癌里面呢，其实还是比较呃相近的。呃那所以呢也是正是基于这个呃研究者发起的这个 C 零零五这个研究呢，目前呢这个在中国呢也正在做这个上市的这个。呃，注册的这个临床研究，呃，那另外呢，我们再稍微再简单提一下，就是说后度靶点 A、C 的这种研究的进展。那我想，除了最早的这个 t d m 1之外呢，那刚才刀哥的棒去提到的 DS 8 2 0 1然后我想呢，目前其实还有我们除了我们自己的呃，今天去跟大家去汇报的这个 r c c 8之外呢，其实现在仍然还有多个的这个针对后度靶点的 A、C 药物呢，也正在进行当中。当然，我想呢，这个。在每个药呢，实际上可能还是有一些这个不同的这个特点。那我们想，包括他们的这个 l i n k e r 包括他们这个呃最后的这个这个细胞毒的这个这个药物呢，其实也不是完全的这个一样。那我想呢，在这个 DS 八 DS 八零幺，我们我们刚才其实也看到了，在多个流动里面这种布局。那这个 RC 七八。那嗯、呃，那嗯、呃，我们也可以看到呢，在除了我们刚才提到的，就是说我们在胃癌里面和尿路上面里面，实际上也在包括胆道癌，包括这个呃非小细胞肺癌、呃乳腺，呃，特别呢，我想呢，其实我们仍然也还想去探索一些，就是说这种相对低表呢，就是我们既往合住阳性的、非合住阳性的病人里面，它的一些呃呃疗效吧。我想，因为这个 H C 药物呢，实际上是跟我们既往这种。传统的这种单功能抗体其实还是不太一样，因为我们刚才也提到它一些药物的一些呃特点。我想这个呢是目前目前正在国内的一些这个研究的一些布局。这个我们刚才也提到了，在我们的各个不同流种里面布局。嗯、呃，好的，这是我跟大家汇报的内容。嗯、呃，谢谢。嗯、呃，大哥的吧。Thank you so much, Dr. Pan. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Yi 
Ying Fang from Kansas Hospital Chinese Academy of Medical Science. Dr. Fang will speak on experience of National Cancer Center on clinical trials for antibody drug conjugate. Dr. Fang, please. Okay, thank you very much for introduction and thank you for your uh, for the invitations. Uh, I was told we are behind the schedule, so I will make it as quick as possible. So um, on behalf of Professor Xu Binghe, I'd like to share uh, some experience, uh, our center experience on clinical trials for ADC drugs. So first, a brief introduction of the hospital, our hospital and the uh, National Cancer Center. Uh, the hospital uh, uh, is the first cancer hospital found in China in 1958. And in 1983, it was moved to the current location and started to interpret medical care, teaching, research, and prevention. And currently, it is the largest cancer hospital uh, in China. Uh, as for the National Cancer Center, it was founded uh, in 2011. And the National Cancer Center was right, uh, resigned to, the, uh, to our hospital, the Cancer Hospital, Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences. So as uh, the National Cancer Center, it has many responsibilities. Uh, uh, it is responsible for the registration, uh, national registration of cancer, uh, the national quality control for standardized cancer diagnosis and treatment. Uh, it is also the National Clinical Research Center for Cancer, but uh, last but not least, it is the National Clinical Trial Center for Anti-Cancer Drug. So uh, uh, the hospital has very good reputation. Uh, uh, it was wrecked uh, as number one in oncology and thoracic surgery in several recognized, such as China Science and Technology Evaluation Metrics, Chinese uh, Hospital Specialty Ranking, and uh, Chinese Best Clinical Specialty Ranking for consecutively uh, many years. We have uh, almost 1,600 beds. The average length of death for inpatient uh, was less than seven days. So uh, in 2019, uh, we received 1 million outpatients, uh, 76,000 inpatients. Uh, the operation, the number for operation was 32,000. And most of the patients uh, come from uh, outside Beijing. So uh, the clinical trial, the, uh, we have the longest uh, history of clinical trials in China. Uh, the, we have a clinical trial center. It, was also, uh, it is also called GCP center. So uh, we investigated the first anti-cancer drug research in China uh, in early 1960s. And we are one of the first clinical uh, Pharmacological Institute on Can Anti Cancer Drugs in China in 1983. Uh, we established the first ethics committee for clinical trials on anti cancer drugs in China in 1996. And we, uh, we, are, we was approved as the first bench of uh, National Clinical Research Center for Anti Cancer New Drugs in next year. Currently, we have a uh, 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 specific uh, awards specifically for clinical trials, uh, about 1,400 million square, including 80 beds, 13 daycare chairs, uh, central pharmacy, rescue room, lab, and tissue bag. So um, uh, among various hospitals in China, so most of the time we, we led clinical trials or as a PIU uh, hospitals uh, among all kinds of hospitals. Here I listed some of the numbers for uh, clinical trials, such as in IND drugs, uh, phase one multi center uh, from 2016 to 2020. So if we look at uh, 48 anti-cancer drugs approved by NMPA from 20, uh, 2018 to 2020, Almost 90% uh, of the drugs were led. Uh, the tri uh, clinical trials were led or partially done yeah, in the hospital. So, in terms of anti-drug uh, conjugates clinical trials for ADC drugs, uh, if we dated back to 2016, 
uh, until now, uh, there are, there were uh, uh, totally uh, there were twenty six uh, clinical trials. Uh, among them, seventy clinical trials uh, are, are are recruiting of uh, finishing recruiting are ongoing. One clinical trials were uh, 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 one clinical trial of, uh, is uh, were was finished, and eighty clinical trials uh, are waiting for initiation. Uh, among them, 20 clinical trials for phase one or phase two for ADC drugs, six for phase three drugs. Uh, 10 of them, uh, we, we worked as a leading PI unit or it is a single center trials. So uh, here I listed, uh, listed the uh, lambs or the code of these ADC drugs. Some are from foreign pharmacies, uh, pharma, uh, pharmaceutical companies, such as uh, TDXD, uh, TDM1, SR408701, or uh, Cicetuximab, uh, Gavitaker. And he, uh, uh, on the right, uh, some of the code for the, for the ADC drugs from domestic pharmaceutical companies. So uh, this ADC drugs, the potential indications for this ADC drugs covers from breast cancer, including HER2 positive or HER2 no expression breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, or her, uh, hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. Uh, from, breast, uh, from breast cancer to non-small cell non-cancer, urethral cancer, blender cancer, Calendular carcinoma, uh, B cell lymphoma, and or, uh, or uh, just the same same as positive solid tumor. Uh, as for the antibody, uh, the target yeah, so the targets included HER2, TROP2, CCOM5, EGFR, CMAT, understanding CD20 or EPICAM. The payload uh, uh, usually. Uh, uh, Usually the payload are DXD, DM1, DM4, or standing CPTC, uh, CPT11, and other DNA damage agent. So just now, Dr. Penn has uh, shared some of the uh, results. Uh, the journey of RC48 uh, in focused on urethral cancer and gastric cancer. So here I like to report some pivot, uh, pilot uh, uh, early uh, study results from the early study of RC48 in breast cancer, uh, which was done in our hospital. So uh, we know that uh, based on the HER2 uh, testing, we can divide the, uh, breast cancer into HER2 positive, HER2 no expression, or HER2 negative breast cancer. So the chemical structure of RC48, uh, just now Dr. Payne has explained very clearly, so I won't take time on that. Uh, uh, for the clinical trials uh, of RC48 in breast cancer, uh, uh, here we reported results from the two phase, uh, two phase one studies. Uh, the, uh, uh, the slides were provided by Professor Wang Jiayu, and the results of this part, this this two phase two, uh, this phase one studies. Uh, was selected as a poster discussion in the forthcoming uh, ASCO meeting uh, in the next month. So uh, we enrolled patients either hard to positive or hard to no expression after uh, standard uh, failure of standard treatment. For, uh, for the first phase one study, C0001 study, it is a standard dose, uh, dose escalation phase one study uh, testing the dose from 0.5 milligram per meter square to 2.5 milligram per meter square. And for the next phase one uh, study, C003 study, there are, uh, there are two parts. Part one is a dose expansion a study still in HER2 positive breast cancer focused on, on three fixed, uh, relatively higher dose of RC48. And for the first two, it is a pilot study to look at the, the uh, efficacy of the, uh, the RC48 in HER2 no breast cancer. So here uh, we show that the drug benefit both HER2 positive and HER2 negative breast cancer. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the, these three different doses, 
here is a, some is a summary of the uh, efficacy of the, uh, RC48 uh, in these three different doses in HER2 positive breast cancer. So you can see that uh, the overall survival, the confirmed overall response rate uh, was from 22% uh, to 40%. And the disease control rate was almost 90% in these uh, three different doses. Now, if we put all the doses, uh, relatively lower dose or, or higher dose together, in hard to positive breast cancer, the uh, confirmed overall response rate was 30, uh, over 30%, and the disease control rate uh, was not over 85%. Now, similarly, in hard to no, uh, hard to no expression breast cancer, the response rate is uh, also uh, very good. It, it is 40% uh, percent, uh, uh, overall response rate and almost 90% of confirmed disease control. So if you look at the waterfall plot on the right side, you can see majority of the patients had disease control, which is, uh, which, uh, which is uh, very impressive. And then, uh, we further look at uh, the subgroup an analysis uh, of the benefit and it showed that uh, there were there are similar overall response rate and progression freeze uh, benefit in all sorts of patients, no matter the age, uh, the ECOC uh, status, the viscerous, the status of visceral metastasis, and etc. The uh, progression, the overall progression free survival, the medium uh, progression for survival for both HER2 positive and HER2 no expression breast cancer was uh, uh, finally 5.6 months. Of course, uh, this is not as impressive as DT, uh, D, DXDT uh, or DSA201, uh, but uh, the toxicity profile is uh, is quite good. It's manageable. Uh, the most the, com the common the most common toxicity is liver function uh, ab uh, liver function abnormality or bone marrow suppression. But you can see uh, majority of them are mild to moderate. The only uh, different uh, different toxicity was uh, uh, was uh, neural toxicity we do see hypoesthesia a relatively higher hypoesthesia in the uh, in the patients uh, there were totally uh, over 60% of patients had all grades of hypoesthesia and for grade 3 uh, uh, more, uh, grade 3 or grade 4 hypoesthesia there are about 90% uh, of the patients, but compared or different with D DXT or with DDM1, we see very scarce uh, thrombocytopenia. Uh, we, we, and we didn't see uh, interstitial lung disease, uh, lung, the toxicity of interstitial lung disease. Uh, here are some other uh, ongoing trials of RC48 in breast cancer. The, uh, currently, we are doing the C006 phase two studies, comparing RC48 versus capsetabine plus lapatinib, the standard uh, uh, treatment, uh, second line treatment for HER2 positive breast cancer uh, in HER2 positive advanced breast cancer. And the target number is 228. And we also are uh, uh, testing this drug in phase three trials uh, uh, compared with the physician's choice in HER2 positive, uh, fish negative, that means HER2 low expression advanced the breast cancer. So uh, we hope that RC48 can be uh, at least a, a alternatively choice for breast cancer patients uh, in China. So of course, uh, ADC drugs uh, has become the, the most shining star in the family of anti-cancer drugs. And uh, 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 we know that the, 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 rap, uh, the rapid progress of uh, ADC, uh, the, the ADC drugs, the, the progress of ADC drugs technology uh, is very rapid. So our knowledge our experience, experience of illicit drugs 
are quite limited. So we, we hope we can work closely uh, with partners from the pharmaceutical companies, from uh, our colleagues uh, in other hospitals. So uh, hopefully we can, just as a slogan of the NCC says, serve the people's health, promote medical in innovation, build harm harmonious system, and finally change the medical world. That's, uh, that's pretty much of it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fan. Now I'd like to invite our, the last speaker, Dr. Song Yujin from Beijing Cancer Hospital. The title of he, her lecture today is Jilongta Clinical Data and Updates in Recurrent or Refractory Diffuse Raji B cell Lymphoma. Dr. Song, please. Thanks for invitation and uh, thanks for introduction. I'm Yu Qin Song from Peking University Cancer Hospital. It's my pleasure to present the clinical data and updates of the nota in relapsed or refractory diffuse large base and lymphoma. The nota is also called Lonkostuximab tesserin. Lonkostuximab tesserin is a combination of humanized anti CD19 antibody and conjugated to a potent PBD dimer toxin. PBD means pyrrolol pencil The majority of B cell malignancies express CD19 at normal to high levels. So long-costuximab testosterone binds to CD19 antigen on tumor cell surface. The ADC agent is internalized, the linker is cleaved, and the PBD dimers were released, released, and then the tumor cells goes to apoptosis. So long, the long term is the first and only CD19 targeted ADC agents approved by the FDA for the treatment of relapsed or refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Here's the research and development history of the nota. Uh, in March 2016, the first patient dosed in phase one trial for the nota. So from first patient enrollment to approval in United States, the nota spent five years. There are four important clinical trials of the nota. And uh, in the next slides, I will focus on the two finished clinical studies. In the phase one study, it's a single arm um, study and uh, included uh, two parts of the uh, two parts in this study. The dose escalation and dose expan expansion study. This part one is the dose es escalation. The design is three plus three, and uh, uh, the primary endpoints were to evaluate the safety and the tolerability, and then to determine the MTD and the dose for part two. In part two of the dose expansion, there are two arms. One is the patients receiving 120 microgram per kilogram every three weeks. And in the other arm, the patients received 150 microgram per kilogram every three weeks in the first three cycles, and then dosage was reduced to 75 microgram per kilogram every three weeks. The primary endpoint was to evaluate the safety and the tolerability of long term, and also the RP. The secondary endpoints were to evaluate the potential clinical efficacy, such as. Uh, the oral response rate, the duration of response, oral survival and progression-free survival, and also PK and ADA. And finally, 186 patients with relapsed or refractory B cell lymphomas were enrolled, including 139 patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Here's the baseline characteristics in this group of patients. The median age was around 63 years old, and uh, nearly 24 patients uh, with double or triple head or expression disease, and uh, nearly 27% uh, of patients with transformed disease from infant disease. 
and the, the median number of previous systemic therapy was three from one to 10, uh, around 22% of patients and 60% of patients were refractory to first line and last line systemic therapies respectively. And also around 21% of patients were refractory or relapsed after stem cell transplantation with CAR-T cellular therapies. The efficacy as a single agent, the NOTA demonstrated satisfied efficacy in relapsed or refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The over response rate uh, was 42.3% and the CR uh, was 23.4%. The median progression free survival was 2.8 months, and the median duration response was 4.5 months. Above. For the safety, the I most important adverse events were fatigue, anemia, nausea, and edema. The most common grade 3 or grade 4 treatment emergent adverse events were gamma GT increased neutropenia, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. The most common treatment emerging adverse events leading to drug discontinuation or gum GT increased in 3.8% of patients and thrombocytopenia in 2.7% of patients. In the phase two study, it's also a single arm open label study. The so enrollment uh, criteria were patients with relapsed or refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma after at least two lines of prior systemic therapy. The primary endpoints were efficacy, the oral response rate by central review and the safety of the whole population in this, two, this phase two study. The long car was given at uh, every three weeks for up to one year. At the, in the first two cycles, Lonka was given at a dosage of 150 microgram per kilogram. And then after the two cycles, Lonka was reduced to 75 microgram per kilogram. And totally 145 patients were enrolled in this study. As for the baseline characteristics, the median age of this group of patients was six was 60 years, 66 years old, and 12% uh, of patients with high-grade large B cell lymphoma or primary middle sternal B cell lymphoma, and 24% of patients with double treat hate, a double or triple hate or expression disease, and 20% uh, of patients with transformed disease from indolent uh, disease, and uh, uh, nearly 77% of patients with advanced stage. The number of previous systemic ther therapy were also uh, three, and uh, uh, nearly 20% of patients and 60% uh, uh, of patients were refractory to first line sy systemic therapy or last line, last line systemic therapy, respe respectively. And 17% uh, of patients refractory to all prior therapies and 70% uh, of patients relapsed after stem cell transplantation. 145 patients received a median number of 4.3 cycles of long term from re, uh, 1 to 15. The efficacy, the, uh, the results uh, were consistent between the independent review committee and the investigator assessment. The oral response rate was around 50% and the complete response rate was nearly 25%. In the subgroup analysis, almost all subgroups benefit from the Lonta treatment, especially in patients with high risk factors, such as in patients with double, triple hit or transformed disease or primary refractory disease. The median duration of response of the 17 responders was around 3rd month and your median duration of response for patients with ACR uh, more than 13 months. The median progression free survival was 5 months and the median overall survival was nearly 10 months. As for the safety, it's very consistent to phase 1 study. Most common 
uh, treatment emergent adverse events uh, higher than grade or grade or grade three or grade four uh, or neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, gum disease increased and anemia. For treatment related uh, adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation occurred in uh, nearly 18% of patients. Most commonly, gum disease increased in 11% of patients for edema in 3% of patients and localized edema in 3 patients. In summary of the phase 2 study, Lonka had a substantial and single agent anti-tumor efficacy in patients with relapsed refractory large vessel lymphoma. The overall response rate was around 48% and CR was around 25%. Durable response rate responses were reported and the encouraging and durable responses were observed in high risk patient groups. No new safety concerns were identified in this study of group. So based on the phase one and the phase two studies, the NOTA uh, got approval by the FDA in this year and listed as recommendation therapy for diffuse blood based lymphoma with uh, relapsed or re uh, refractory disease after at least two three lines by NCC guidelines. There are two ongoing studies of the long term. The, uh, one is the phase one, phase two ongoing study of the long term plus abrutinib in relapsed or refractory diffuse large base cell lymphoma and mental cell lymphoma. Since the long term was given at a dosage of six a 60 microgram per kilogram plus abrutinib 560 milligram continues to have encouraging anti-tumor activity. And the overall response rate for all patients was around 63%, especially in patients with non-GCB diffuse blood based lymphoma two thirds and uh, in mental cell lymphoma, 83%. And the CR for all patients were around 31.4%, uh, especially for patients with non-GCB diffuse large vein cell lymphoma, 37.5% and in mental cell lymphoma, one third. Another phase two or phase three ongoing study is the long plus rituximab versus rituximab plus GMOX as a phase three randomized uh, global study. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Song, for your very beautiful lecture. So now we, we're gonna have a Q&A session for 10 minutes. So here is a first question from the attendee. The question is, what are the resistance mechanism to antibody conjugate? What are the subsequent treatment after progress on ADCs? I'd like to ask this question to Dr. Poils. Dr. Poils, could you answer to that question, please? Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, I think that the, res the resistant mechanisms of drugs um, is, is important because um, I could think that we can see from the Kaplan-Meier curves that the progression-free um, survival curves come down to close to zero in that the majority of patients in the end progress. And single agent ADC doesn't seem to be curing the majority of patients. And there are issues around durability of response. And this means because the response rates are high, and because ultimately patients progress, it suggests that there is quite a lot of acquired resistance to drugs. And so we need to look into that in detail. And clearly there are different components of acquired resistance, but intracellular resistance appears to be the likeliest cause. And each drug will have different mechanisms of resistance. So it's a whole new area of biomarker research for us in the future. One of the key questions is how we overcome this resistance. And clearly one of the approaches is to combine with immune therapy. And that goal is to induce initial responses result in neoantigen um, release 
generation of antibodies, which subsequently might result in more durable responses. And we're seeing that in some of the work that we're doing. So I think that's the first point. I think it's quite interesting that, and this is relevant, that the sequencing of these therapies appears not to be associated with cross resistance. And you would sort of expect that because if it's a different antibody with a different drug and a different payload, the mechanism of resistance from different drugs is ultimately gonna be different. And so it may be that by sequencing ADCs, we can actually overcome resistance as well. And so I think that's um, a second point. And then clearly there's a more complex issue about whether we can be combining ADCs together. Uh, and I don't, <laughs> I haven't tried that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going too soon, but I like I like the principle of that. So I think it's a very thoughtful question, and, and I think those are my current uh, my current approaches. Thank you so much for your kind explanation. And the next question was: Will the toxicity of ADC have any potential impact on the product development? And I like to answer to this question. Yes, my answer is yes. The safety or toxicity profile of novel ADC will influence on the clinical development of that agent. So in general, most of the toxicities from ADC uh, come from uh, payload, freely released payload. So mostly hematologic or uh, gastrointestinal. So it is caused by so-called toxicities of payload. Sometimes some ADC may have unique uh, toxicity with the dead agent. For example, today, uh, Dr. Paul says that amphotomab betotin has a higher incidence of rash and with paltrasumab that has taken there is a higher instance of intercellular lung disease. So it depends on ADC as a whole. So that's my answer. And I'd like to ask a question about RC40A to Dr. Peng or Dr. Fang. So payload of this Noble ADC from China RC48 is MMAE, a microtubule inhibitor. Is that right? Then, as you know, most of patients with gastric cancer are pre-treated with paclitaxel or dotaxel at the second line setting. So they, their cancer cells may have resistance to microtubule inhibitor in the sense Top of one inhibitor may be better than microtubule inhibitor as a payload. How do you think about that point? Uh, yeah, yes, Dr. Uh, it's a very uh, good question. Uh, because some um, advanced gas cancer were resistant to uh, paglitaxel, but uh, in uh, our phase two uh, trial, uh, we found that uh, uh, most of the patients have used the paglitaxel or uh, the, um, uh, so, but uh, the OR of the uh, PFS is uh, uh, do not, uh, um, is the same for the, the patients that did not use the paglitaxel. So I do not know why, but uh, uh, the, uh, the phase two trial uh, re uh, result is, uh, is that uh, the RC48 uh, for, uh, for is uh, can also uh, is useful for these patients. Yeah, so uh, I do not uh, any uh, comments for Dr. Fang. Yeah, I, I partially agree with Dr. Ben that uh, maybe this is uh, more important in breast cancer because uh, Texans was uh, almost uh, the commonly used uh, drugs in breast cancer. So that's why I think why the efficacy of RC48 is not as good as the uh, DXD, DXD. But uh, uh, 
but I think uh, it also can be tried or uh, maybe it can also be effective uh, in breast cancer as well because uh, the mechanism is different. It is uh, it works in the cells of the two in the in in the tumor inside the tumor cells, and we also see a similar uh, phenomena such as uh, lab paclitaxel or uh, albumin bound paclitaxel is also uh, it is also a microtubule or when the real being, it is also a microtubule uh, uh, agent but it is also uh, partially express uh, uh, effective in breast uh, in breast cancer pretreated with taxons so uh, of course uh, we hope for better adcs but uh, currently it can also be a choice uh, uh, that's my uh, opinion thank you thank you so much now, I'd like to conclude the, this session here because I hope our audience will enjoy the coffee break. So I'd like to thank everybody, especially like to thank Dr. Pauls. Actually, it is the midnight for him. Thank, thank you, everybody. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.